Okay. So, for this evening's talk, I decided to choose the subject, at least to start off with the subject, and just to see where it goes. Uh, because this evening's talk is going to be started off on the subject of... Wait for it. Isn't it exciting when you don't know what you're coming here for? Because sometimes the, you know, people have a subject already put out there, so they've got something to expect. But this is on the subject of fear. Are you afraid? What might happen? Usually, our life is just stunted by fear. And by stunted, it means there's so many opportunities we have in our life, so many different things we can explore and do, but fear stops us. Little things like giving a talk, a public talk. People are just so afraid of giving a, a public talk. Isn't that the case, Venerable? <laughs> but, I'm not afraid. And it's a wonderful thing that sometimes, you know, they keep telling me the, the most scary thing you can ever do is actually to give a public talk. But I, I enjoy this. You know, sometimes that when you're talking to people without any plan, they haven't got a clue what you're going to say. It's just like spending 45 minutes with your friends to create that, that kindness, that empathy, that ability to be with people. So you don't feel afraid anymore. You relax. Unfortunately, that many people are so afraid and one of the things we're afraid of is we're afraid of making mistakes. And of course, I probably told this last week. Now let's tell the story of um, one of the movies which I used to watch, and actually TV shows when I was a kid. Now remember, I was a Buddhist when I was only 16. And it's very hard to find anything related to Buddhism or, or that, especially on the TV. But there was one movie and it was called Kung Fu. And I remember I just watched that every time, every week it was on. I remember some of my friends who said, this is supposed to be Buddhist, because there's violence every week. What's that got to do with Buddhist? Well, it's the closest we can get, because you know, sometimes in TV, if you don't have violence, you, know, you can't actually get it published, or people don't watch it. It was just like you know, some years ago, somebody told me that uh, Sarah Jessica Parker, from Sex in the City, she was seen in a coffee shop in the United States, reading my book, Open the Door of Your Heart. She was a Buddhist, she was a follower. So I thought, wow, if Sarah Jessica Parker, of Sex in the City, was one of my disciples, it was only a matter of time that I get a cameo, invited to, to come in to one of her episodes. And I thought that would be really interesting. Ajahn Brahm in one of the episodes in Sex in the City. <laughs> and then I started thinking, what would it be like? I, I, I wouldn't mind doing anything, you know, just a reason, not making my precepts. We'd have to change the episode title to instead of Sex in the City, No Sex in the Monastery. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, hang on. I don't think anyone would tune into that episode, because I know human nature. <laughs> so, so that was the end of that idea. <laughs> and even other things, because I remember it's just, uh, I love going off subject. I, and the, a similar thing, that when I, I still remember this, the first year I was in Thailand, that there was a newspaper that had a cartoon called Supermuck. And it's like a cartoon strip, not Superman or Batman or something. And Super Monk was this, you know, this monk who could like fly through the air, had a few powers, you know, could stop trains and stuff like that. It was, you know, using his superpowers, but for good things, no violence, and just really compassion and kindness. And so when you get the bad guy, Super Monk would you know, stop the bad guy destroying the world. 
I don't know why there was bad guys. But anyway, that's another thing. I won't go there, get into trouble again. So Superman, always, you know, super monk, the bad guys, and he would actually stop the bad guys from doing like how oh, blowing up the world or destroying people or robbing banks or something like that. And then at the very end, Superman, he wouldn't punish the bad guys. You know, he wouldn't sort of put um, handcuffs on them and send them to jail. Superman would always be so kind, explain, that's bad karma, but we practice forgiveness in this, this path. You acknowledge your mistakes. You forgive them, you learn from them, okay? So next time, you know, bad guy, you know, just don't do it again, okay? Off you go. So there was no violence, there was no sort of punishment, no sex, no nothing. So I, I was really quite impressed with that, super monk. So there was, you know, I do have connections, there was somebody who actually worked for Steven Spielberg. And I suggested, why don't you tell Stephen over in, in Dream, was it DreamWorks? Is that DreamWorks? Yeah, anyway, whatever his company is over in, in Hollywood, why didn't you tell him a great idea for a new franchise? All the other ones have been just all done so many times. Batman, Iron Man, Rusty Man, uh, <laughs> Copper Woman or something, I don't know. What they got now? What about platinum? That's supposed to be a very good man. Anyway, they've done all those super heroes, but they haven't done super monk yet. And I worked out the plot already. After super monk, of course, then we have super nun. We've got to keep it equal. And super novice. <laughs> super secretary of the PSWA. <laughs> oh, we've got, we've got lots of cats in the world. What about super cat? That'd be a really good one, super cat. Anyway, um, I was already done that, and they got Catwoman. Okay, super mouse. And whatever. <laughs> so I thought of all these great plots, but of course, then, you know, they came back, they're, of course, not interested. There's no sex, no violence. No sex, no violence. No one goes to watch it these days. Really weird, isn't it? But anyway, I had all these great ideas, but. Why is people just so afraid these days? Somehow or other, we're born in fear. Even when you are, uh, this is one of the books which I remember we had in our monastery so many years ago, it was about how to give birth. How, when you're pregnant, how to give birth. We had this in a monastery full of monks in Northeast Thailand. <laughs> and people go, what you got that in here for? And the reason we had it in there for, because it was actually a wonderful example just of how you can change the world by changing attitudes. So in this birthing book, which apparently people said became like a, almost like a standard text, it was you know, basically practiced by a bunch of hippies who you know, left you know, the Summer of Love in San Francisco, Haight-Ashbury, and just got a little commune together, did things differently. And of course, young people, uh, when people got pregnant, Number one, they never called it labor pain. That was a no-no. You call it labor pain and it becomes pain. They call it labor energy. Now this, you know, you think this is not much, but when, for, you know, when you found out you're pregnant for seven months or six months or whatever, being conditioned, you know, the first couple of months you don't know maybe. I, mean, I don't know really what I'm talking about, but you know, roughly you get the idea that, um, <laughs> that when you call it labor energy, call it labor pain, it changes the psychology of it. And of course, they didn't just have the, the, um, the, the husband there, they had just the whole family just about. Everybody was like at a football match. And when you had a big contraction, yeah, go for it, wow, that's a big one, wow, that was amazing. And everyone was cheering them along. And because it was just so much like a party, when they were giving birth, and they never looked at, at pain, the the labours were incredibly short. They had a had to have a, a, a doctor, you know, a, a doctor from the local town or something. who was just amazed at this, you know, how it, well it worked. Short, not painful, and amazing babies were born because they took away the idea of fear from the whole process, and the same with growing up. 
When you're a kid, how many times you know, you, you're taught, don't put your hand in the fire, it will hurt. Well, you know, you say that, but you, know, you have to do it once, and then you hear it, fear it. How many times when you have the, you know, there's wet paint, you know, don't touch wet paint. That's an invitation <laughs> to touch it. <laughs> or men at work, slow down. Well, it's true. I mean, the men at work keep slowing down. Every time I pass them, they're working pretty slowly. <laughs> but anyhow, just why is it that, you know, we have to control people through fear? We learn fear. Isn't there another way of living our life, not through fear, but through wisdom? You know, because what I learned, maybe you can understand this, at school, you know, you made a mistake, you did something wrong, and you were punished. And all I ever learned from being punished was to be more smart so I never got caught next time. That's all. I never realized why, what was wrong, what was I doing wrong? I was just being a kid, just exploring. Just, you know, what was I doing wrong? And so it got so sort of um, uh, fearful that, you know, all I learned you know, from things like rules and punishments. I didn't know why those rules were there. Instead, you just, you know, just um, decided to make sure next time you weren't caught. So that's all I ever learnt from that. And so later on, I said, why? You know, why, why are you doing these things? After a while, you became sensitive, you had empathy, you learned compassion, so, you know, you didn't want to do bad things. It wasn't because I was afraid. You know that, you know, even simple things, like, well, you know, you've got to uh, confess that if I went on the public transport in London, if they didn't ask for my fare, I thought, well, it's your fault, you should have asked for it, I didn't want to pay it. But then after a while I thought, well, you know, just, instead of like being punished, you know, if you, if you get caught not paying the fare on the London bus, which I never did, I was a bit too smart, but instead I thought, I said, not really smart, I thought I was just getting away with stuff. But then I thought afterwards, no, that, you know, somebody's got to pay for this bus, and it's a really nice service, public transport is really great. Especially in a, in a place like London, you get anywhere on public transport. I love going on those, those tube trains, have a wonderful time over there. You meet a lot of good people on those tube trains, and sometimes, I don't know why it is, they look at me and they, you know, that last time I was in London, they looked at me and said, oh, are you a monk? And you, you know, you sort of wonder just you know, what intelligence people have on the trains. Well, what do you think I am? <laughs> you know, I'm going to a fancy dress party. <laughs> and they said, a real monk? Yeah, I'm a real monk. <laughs> so they have a lot of fun, sort of, you know, just meeting people you know, on the sort of the underground trains or being out in public transport. So I love public transport. It's a wonderful way of of you know, not being in a car all the time. And in a car you've just got a couple of people talking to you, and in public transport you can talk to everybody. Okay, I've got to retell this story, because, you know, that, you know, people were getting a taste of Dhamma, Buddhism. So the last time I was on there, I told you about a month ago, I think, last time I was on there, on the public transport, a lady came to, next to me, sat and said, are oh, you a, a monk? I said, yeah, a real monk, yeah. I said, oh, I always want to find out a little bit about Buddhism. So we're talking about Buddhism, meditation, all sorts of things. And then we came on to the, the subject of reincarnation. Some of you heard this only about a month ago or something. And re on reincarnation, because you want to know about these things. She was interested. And so I said, oh, well, I, you know, to understand, I'll tell you a story. Because this happened just on the retreat, just after, I think in October, November, when we had a retreat over at um, Jana Grove Meditation Center, and there was an Italian man who was meditating there. And so after, right, during the meditation retreat, he came up to me and said he had a very, very couple of strange dreams, weird dreams. The first night, he dreamt he was a piece of spaghetti. That's weird. <laughs> the second night, he dreamt he was a piece of ravioli. Now, I know it's we don't eat in the afternoons there, but it wasn't that he was hungry. The first night he dreamt he was a strand of spaghetti, the next night a piece of ravioli. You know, after a while, you, you, I got it. You know, it's quite obvious when you, you hear it. 
that you know he was recollecting his pastor lives. <laughs> He's Italian, okay, pastor lives. <laughs> Uh, I told that a couple of weeks ago, but still a good goal note. <laughs> and had half the, the the underground carriage were laughing, and I you know, I never seen that before. They're just all these people, you know, lifting their heads up from their newspapers. They were pretending they weren't listening all the time or doing the SMS, but they were listening. And, and when the punchline came, they were laughing. It was amazing the way I spread Buddhism in that underground train that morning. <laughs> Like a happy, just you no know, joyful, you no know, fun little path. So that's a really important thing to do. But you know, no fear at all. But this is sometimes why sometimes people are so afraid. What other people think of them? What are you doing that for? Because that's what I learned when I was young. Oh, make sure that you know you dress properly. Make sure that you know your hair's all in the right place. Oh, it's so great being a monk. Never have a bad hair day, ever. So, <laughs> so when you can relax and you have no fear, you come across as confident. And when you're confident, it's amazing what that does to your health. So much sickness comes from fear. So much, well, oh, this... This was when I, I didn't go to the Kung Fu story first. I, I'd have to go back to the Kung Fu story, then the Edgar Allan Poe story. I love these stories. This was Kung Fu. This was a story of little grasshopper and his blind master in this ancient temple over somewhere in China a long time ago. And of course, little grasshopper had to be trained by his master in the, in the serious, deep parts of Buddhism. Now this is real Buddhism. It's not just you know, learning the texts all the time. The texts are important, gives you a foundation. But you know, the real stuff is actually through, through life, through reflection, deep meditation, kindness, understanding why, how you work. You can read it in a text, you can hear it from a monk like me, but actually experiencing it makes it very real and powerful. So, they took little grasshopper into this dark room and usually kept locked at the back of the temple. And when they led him into, of course, the blind master, because he was blind, you know, he could actually know the place just by feeling, smell, whatever. But little grasshopper, it took him a while for his eyes to accommodate to the darkness and because it was always kept locked, it was a scary place even before you went in it. What were they hiding in there? Why was it locked? Why could little novices not go in there? There must be something scary in here. So he went in there and when his eyes you know, became accustomed to the dark light, that was when the master asked, Grasshopper, what do you see? And of course, you know, the, the TV, this was only in the 70s, but it was really effective, you know, black and white. And they can see there was like an indoor swimming pool. He said, there's, there's a pool there. He said, go closer and tell me more, said the master. But don't go too close. And so little grasshopper walked to the edge of the pool. What do you see? He said, I see bones. There's bones in the bottom of the pool. Yes, said the master, because that is not water. That is concentrated acid. And those bones, those bones of little novices like you, who fell in. <laughs> and you could, even I watching, no, in, I think this was in Devon when I was watching this. Even I was a little bit scared. And he moved away from the, the pool. I moved a little bit away from the TV set. It's amazing just how stupid people are. <laughs> what else do you see, little gossip? I see a plank of wood stretching from one end of the pool to the other end. Yes, said the master. This is going to be your test. In seven days' time, you will have to walk across that plank 
over the asset, like every novice has to do, is part of the training. And because I don't want you to fall in, I don't want you to join the bones in the bottom of that lake of acid. Come outside. And he went outside. And outside in the courtyard was another plank of wood, exactly the same size, length, thickness, and width as the one over the acid. But this was suspended over two bricks. Everything else, all your other duties, you don't have to do for the next seven days. Practice. Because after seven days, you will have the test, the exam. And it's important. This is not just a being selected for a special school. A little girl came in today. It's not just like getting uh, the, the test for the, the um, uh, was it, the doctors. It's not like the test for the year 12s or your driving exam or PhD, this is a big test. Because if you fail, you're in the acid, burning and dying. So, he went outside and after even a half a day, you could run along that plank. Do it blindfolded, do it backwards, you can dance, you can do anything on that plank because it was only above the ground, maybe a few inches. But after seven days came the exam and he went into that darkened room and the master said, get on the end of the plank. And he could see little grasshopper didn't want to go, but he couldn't refuse. So he got on the end of the plank. Walk, shouted the master. And you could see the acid only a few inches underneath the plank. And the bones at the bottom of the, the pool of acid. So a little grasshopper had to start walking. And he walked and you could see he wasn't as steady as on the plank of wood on the outside. Because the plank of wood over acid is much narrower and longer than the same size over a sort of courtyard. And so he started walking and you could see his, his feet became a bit unsteady. You could see his, his knees start to shake a little bit. You could see he started to wobble. You see he could swaying. It looked like he was going to fall in. And you know what happened? Commercial break. <laughs> Do they still have those these days? A the really important part. I had to do this stupid, you know, which soap powder wash whiter, you know, what toothpaste you should use to be more attractive to the opposite gender. All those stupid commercials, I was really worried about my friend, the only Buddhist I know on the TV, little grasshopper, who's about to die and get, get burned to death with acid because of that really cruel master. This was really important. But finally we were back. We're back. <laughs> but, I think they stood there. They always go a few, few seconds before they finished off. And you could see him. His legs started to get a bit weak. He started to shake. He started to wobble. It looked like he was going to fall in. And that was exactly where we left off. I said, what's going to happen next? And he fell in. He actually fell in. The pool of acid. And I was so worried. And you know that sadistic, heartless, uncompassionate master, he was laughing his head off. He was laughing uproariously. So that's not compassion when your disciple is being, being drowned in an acid pool. Would I do that to you? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, what happened? It's, then you saw a little grasshopper. He was splashing around, splashing around, then he stopped splashing, and this is not burning. And that's when, <laughs> that's when the master said, little grasshopper, it's not acid, it's only water. We just threw the bones in there, special effects. That's all. And then the reason why, the, the whole exercise. And I always remembered this. He said, why did you fall in, little grasshopper? Why did you fall in? Fear pushed you in. Only fear. That's why you fell in. And that left a big impression on me. If that was water, if it had been said to be water all the time, 
you'd have run across that plank so many hundreds of times without ever falling in. Fear pushes you in. It's fear makes you fail. So the next time you do an examination anywhere, why do you fail? It's only fear makes you fail. You lose so many marks. You fail your driving test. You know, you fail, you know, the interview in your job. Just fear makes you fail, that's all. Fear makes you sick. So much tension which comes fear. Fear, what would happen if if I fell in? A lot of time you don't fall in. So this is one of the reasons why fear is one of the terrible things which stunts our growth, makes us fail, don't reach our potential and don't even have fun in life. So, how do we overcome fear? Fear is looking into the future with a negative mind. Looking at what might happen that might go wrong. Instead, we look into the future, if we look into the future at all, with a positive mind, instead of a negative mind. And a good example of that, which I've used to my advantage so many times, that there was this um, case of, I was going to Singapore to give a series of talks in the, uh, what was it, uh, the convention center, in Suntec City Convention Center. About four or five thousand and, um, seats. And to be able to get people to go there, they had to advertise. And they advertised on the, my face on the back of buses <laughs> you know, in Singapore. And of course, as soon as they told me that, I had to go and we were running around, not running around, in the car, chasing around the roads in Singapore, looking for one of the buses with my photo on the back. It's just so I could take a photograph and I could say with all honesty and 100% accuracy that Ajahn Brahm is true, I have got a face like the back of a bus. <laughs> <laughs> that was really fun. But then, just before you know, that I landed in Singapore, that was the time they had SARS. Remember SARS? Sudden Acute Respiratory Syndrome. And I, you, know, you, you get the newspaper on the aircraft. And then this was the Straits Times. This big advertisement. You know, in the front, the headlines, in big black letters. You now, capitals really exaggerated. 99 cases of SARS has been confirmed in Singapore. That morning, all the schools have been closed, shut down. And the government had encouraged no public gatherings. Oh my goodness. I was about to start my a series about three or four talks. And the organizers, they had, they had hired this really expensive auditorium. They put a lot of money in the advertising. And as I came out of the customs, there was all the people there, they were so afraid. I had a big delegation. I jumped on, what should we do? What should we do? Ah! <laughs> and of course, I said, tell me something. 99 people have been confirmed with SARS. What is the population of Singapore? And I think at the time they said 4 million. Well, let's do the math. 4 million and 99 people have got SARS. That means 3,999,901 people haven't got SARS. So that means it's a 40,000 to 1 chance that you won't get SARS. That's pretty good odds to me. Let's do it. <laughs> so why is it, you know, 99 people? Ah, it's like everyone's got SARS. And anyway, when I had the meetings for, for four days, you know, what and SARS, sudden acute, it's a respiratory disease. What's the best way of actually overcoming respiratory illness? Strengthen your lungs. Laugh a lot. Because <laughs> when you laugh, you're really exercising your lungs. And number two, with that laughter, with that happiness, endorphins are going into your blood stream 
nature's immune uh, supporters, immune uh, it's disease suppressants. So it was obvious to me. So, <laughs> so I, we did that, and it was very, very well received by everybody. It was how we prevent SARS, but more importantly, how we prevent fear. By looking at another way, looking at the future, thinking of all the things which might go wrong, look at the future, all the things which might go right. So just not, just I'm going to fail, it's all going to go wrong, I'm too afraid to give this a chance to do another thing another way. If we're afraid that way, of course, and then we just, there's no life at all for us. No even adventure in life. Now, adventure is just you know, even when. Um, to go outside of your comfort zone, it's amazing just how many people are, have a comfort zone. And when it gets challenged, they're too afraid to maybe see things in a different way. I remember this story. A long time ago, this fellow was in deep pain in a hospital in New York. Just you know, really sort of the, I don't know what, the doctors or the nurses, whatever, they couldn't sort of overcome the, the illness or the, the pain. And so the daughter came in with this guru figure with long hair. And this was like, you know, just you know, like, of, like a Mr. Trump. You know, didn't want any of these weirdos in his bedroom. But came in there and this, this so-called weirdo said, I don't want to hear anything from this guy, he's weird. He didn't like the philosophy of the East. But anyway, this weirdo you know, was just standing at the end of the bed while the daughter was talking to her father. He was in deep pain. And the, the guru started giving this man a foot massage. And the pain went. The pain disappeared. And he said, get away from my feet, you weirdo. He'd rather have the pain than have his whole idea of what's possible challenged. We're so afraid of our views, possibilities opening up to us. We'd rather just have life as we know it and understand it than have it challenged. We're so afraid of something different. And that is one of the big problems of our life. I remember just, you know, I just saw in the newspapers they have the um, the Claremont um, killings, you know, the serial killer. Apparently they have a suspect who's being tried at the moment. But I remember meeting one of the, the mothers of one of those young girls, you know, who was one of the people murdered in the Claremont killings. I met her at a grief and loss conference over in Observation City some years ago. And I was telling her all the wonderful stories how you can let go of grief. And, you know, they work. But she came up to me afterwards. I remember this. And it really opened up a lot of understanding about psychology. She came up to me, almost nose to nose, shouting at me. And she said, how dare you take away my grief? And that was really strange. There, there was a path opening up to her. She realized it. She followed that path where I was leading her. She could be free from her grief, but she didn't want to. She was afraid of going away from a situation she got used to. And weird, but she got a lot of sympathy and help and understanding. It was actually who she was. She was a famous person she got a lot of compassion because of that grief. And I would say, you can be free from it. She didn't want to go. This is why sometimes we're afraid of letting go of our pain. We're afraid of being courageous enough to see things in a different way. And maybe taking that journey and seeing some peace and some freedom. It does take courage. That's why the whole idea of a getting out of your comfort zone. Out of your comfort zone, it can be even more comfortable. And of course, the most obvious example of this is the prisoner. The prisoner who's been in jail for maybe 30 or 40 years. And tomorrow, they're going to be free. And they just do not want to go. 
Why? It is because they got used to jail. They don't, they're afraid of freedom. Maybe they can't cope with that freedom. It's just too easy to stay in prison. And I've seen that many, many times. It's fear keeps you in jail. And sometimes that little bit of encouragement to come out. You know in jails these days when people get released, they don't get just released straight away. They get let out of the jail slowly, softly. We can release, first of all. Maybe just doing voluntary work, first of all. You know, and then going back every evening. Just to have this gentle release you know, into freedom. Because just doing all in one go is just too much. It's the same. That the fear of the new, the fear of freedom, we have to take it gently. Little by little, stage by stage. Just like the story of the kid being taken, maybe four or five year old kid, taken to the swimming pool to learn how to swim for the first time. Imagine what it must feel like to be a child. You've just learned to walk, you know, be able to stand up and run without falling over. And now you have to, to somehow understand and cope with this stuff which is not solid, water, the whole pool of it. It's okay jumping in a puddle and making everybody wet, but just a whole pool. So how do you get a kid to do that? So the mummy just lets it put one toe in, first of all. Take it out, that feels okay. A whole foot, take it out, it's safe, it's only a foot. A leg, then dip it in and then take it out again, mummy's still holding it. And then eventually you let the kid go into the pool. And once the kid's in the pool, splashing around, enjoying itself, it's very hard to get the kid out of the pool again. <laughs> it's too much fun. So much in life, whether it's in meditation, whether it's becoming a monk, public speaker, going into a new career, letting go of grief or pain or sickness. Sometimes people don't want to get well. They got so used to being sick that somehow being free is a bit weird. So this is actually why fear just blocks so many avenues to freedom, to health, to peace in life. So instead we just learn just how to challenge fear and realize it's just something which keeps making us fall in in life. And of course, the way to it is looking at the future with a positive mind. You know, life is growth. Life is never going to be static. We always learn new things. That's part of life. If you think you've learned enough, you're dead. And if you can't change and grow, you're stunted. So we always tend you know, to to challenge, to learn, add new things, say new things, to actually be able to, to even advance and grow, never sort of stay still. Never sort of in stay still in our ways of expressing, moving, looking at this world, changing this world, making it better, but not because we are backward looking out of fear of the future. Somebody was asking me earlier about the Buddhist idea of karma and about how fear comes into this. This whole idea of like karma, karma is old karma, where you come from, what's happened to you in the past. The old karma is the ingredients you have to work with in life. Now I have to work with the ingredients of having a father who told terrible jokes. That's, you know, and you know, I can't stop myself ter telling terrible jokes. Which is a nice segue into today's jokes. I tried it out on a few of you to begin with, just to make sure it works. But this is to see, you have to be intelligent to understand this, this joke. And somebody told me this last um, Saturday or Sunday, I forget, so thank you to this gentleman. He said, why, why don't you see elephants hiding in trees? Why don't you see elephants hiding in trees? And don't say it's because they can't climb the trees, or they're too big, or the branches will break. That's not the answer. The answer is why you don't see elephants hiding in trees, because they're too good at hiding. That's why you never see them. <laughs> <laughs> you 
they're very good hiders. Just like the story of the, the US Army who brought the state-of-the-art camouflage trucks. Now they can't find them where they parked them. <laughs> so that's why you can't, can't see elephants hiding in trees. They're too good at hiding. Okay, that's an intellectual joke, so maybe a bit above you. <laughs> that, wa that wasn't. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> It's logically consistent. Go outside. I bet this weekend you won't see an elephant in a tree. Because they're, they're too good at hiding. It proves it. It's logically consistent. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. So, so, the whole idea of like being afraid who you are. Being afraid what other people think of you. And this is so important for people who are so-called one of my worst words, but I don't know another word for it, somebody disabled, different, strange. They're not the same as you and I, whatever that means. That fear of difference, that fear of, of allowing people in, it's really something which creates so much misery in this world. And it's, that's why that, well, here we go again, another forest story. I don't tell this story every month, every week about the old um, story of, the, of the, um, the forest. There's no such thing as a perfect tree. All trees are bent and crooked and damaged. Every tree in the forest is damaged. So if anyone feels that they're different, they're damaged, and not the same as everybody else, of course you're not. But you belong. Every tree in the forest is damaged goods. So if you're damaged goods, number one, welcome to the forest called humanity. You belong. Just that much, you belong. You know, you're not excluded. You're part of life. That's just such a wonderful thing to, to know. Because a lot of times, if you're any different, we're afraid of differences, we hide it. We try and just, you know, think, pretend it doesn't exist. Put it in institutions, put it in places where other people can't see. But, no, everyone belongs. It's beautiful when People feel that they belong, they're respected, they're part of things. But the other part of that story, which oh, just, I just really love this part of it, is, and this is so true, the most damaged trees in the forest, the ones that are most bent and crooked, are my favourite ones. They're the ones you keep going back to again and again and again. So just because you're different, doesn't mean you're excluded, doesn't mean you're not beautiful. In fact, you're the most favourite ones. So this is changing the whole idea of, of being fear, of being different. So once one of the most important things, so when you're just who you are, you're not afraid of who you are. You don't need to change, because fear of who you are, fear of expressing yourself, fear of just, you know, you, where's Mrs. Grumpy? <laughs> that, that, <laughs> A wonderful woman who's got the first grumpy license, she was afraid of just being grumpy. She was trying to be happy, trying her best to be happy. You know, apparently the people told me that Finland is the most happiest people in the world. Now they've got to prove it. We've got a Finnish monk in our monastery. You can go and check him out and say, ha ha ha, you're supposed to be happy. Take that, <laughs> take that scowl off your face. <laughs> it really pushes the pressure on you. You're supposed to be happiest race. Monks are supposed to be compassionate and happy, so and there's a lot of pressure on monks sitting up here. You know, I'm supposed to be happy. And there was a time when I was thinking, oh my goodness, I'm supposed to be a really good monk, I must make sure I don't fall asleep when I meditate. And sometimes I have, I remember some months I was meditating, <laughs> everyone could see it. And it was on, on. <laughs> you say the wrong word. It was, you're sleepy because you just come back from a long trip overseas or something. It's nature. So you don't worry about that. So when you're not afraid of making mistakes, number one, you make less. Number two, you're more confident. Number two, you have, three, you're healthy. I can't even count properly. Number three, you're healthy. <laughs> okay, the old joke. You know, there's, there's three types of accountants in this world. One who can count one who can't count. That's it. 
<laughs> Which one am I? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so not to be afraid of life, not to be afraid of making mistakes, not to be afraid of different, not to be afraid of anything in life, to look at the present and the future and respect it. If things do go wrong in life, you know you get the sack. I've been trying to get the sack for years. So I can <laughs> retire and have a nice time. Oh boy. I think that's one of the reasons I don't get the sack, because I'm trying so hard to... <laughs> Maybe I should just let go and just see what happens. But anyway, that so much fear. I just remember just going to one person's house and she had these two Rottweilers chained up. And so she said, um, no, it's okay, you don't need to be afraid of the Rottweilers, they're all chained up. So they walked right past them and only afterwards, you know, she will, I was had a heart attack, oh my goodness, I forgot to put the chains on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if you're a kind person, they won't harm you. This is a wonderful thing, fear, oh, they can pick up fear straight away. And of course, then they go and bite you. Me, hey, you're kind, of course they won't bite you. Over in Thailand, you used to have all these snakes crawling over you. And oh, the best ones were the, the um, well not the scorpions, the scorpion centipedes, was the tarantulas. I love the tarantulas. Honestly, because in the hot weather, you know, there's, you know, you just had your lower robes on, just like you know, guys at the beach. You know, it's just too hot to wear your upper robes. You know, it's still decent. So, you know, if you're laying on your back, you know, the centipedes would actually drop on, not the centipedes, the tarantulas would drop on you. you know, there's been a big, big spiders about the size. They drop on you, and they go boom, 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 boom. And it's really nice, it was tickly. <laughs> it's like a little massage, boom, 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 boom. And then you can wait for another one to drop from there, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that, it was fun. <laughs> so they wouldn't harm you, so you wouldn't harm them. So, you know, we had this wonderful uh, playing, they're dropping from the roof onto the monk, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> But anyway, that's when you have no fear. The animals don't harm you. And it's also when you have no fear, you have a much more peaceful life, much more healthier life. So that's one of the reasons why. Don't be afraid of this moment. Don't be afraid of letting go. So many opportunities there to let go. Yeah, you go out of your comfort zone, try new things, do new ways. It's amazing what can happen. But the problem is, when we're afraid, Afraid what other people think of us. Afraid this can't be right. But you feel it is right. So just go for it. And that way you can pass exams. You can be confident uh, when you go for interviews with your boss. You can go confident when you have your exams. You can have confidence anywhere. It's amazing how many people succeed that way. Yeah, I do do chanting to try and increase people's confidence. It's amazing. I can never forget this Malaysian girl. I don't know if she's here today. But... You know, 16 times she failed the, English, the ELS test the, you know, for getting a permanent visa. 16 times she failed. And she needed that to stay in Australia. She's a very intelligent lady. But then she asked me, so what should I do? And so I said, take it again. But I failed 16 times. Ah, but you never was blessed by Ajahn Brahm before, were you? <laughs> mm. <laughs> so she did it. And so I gave her a good blessing, and a few days later she rang up, and said, yeah, you passed. How did you know? Because you were blessed by me, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that was really good, that. <laughs> Sixteen times she failed, and got the blessing, and it worked. Just encouraging and making her confident. Not psychic powers or anything, just the confidence, giving it, yeah, you can do this, go on, yeah, it'll work. So that's how these things happen. So please take away the fear. And then you'll be very happy and very successful, healthy, and also progress in life. See what happens in life. Explore this world and explore the world inside without any fear and see how far you can go. I've gone far enough. Sadhu. Sadhu. So do <laughs> you know? I don't be afraid of doing extreme things like that. Not many other monks do those extreme sadhus. <laughs> I invented it, so 
good fun. So anyway, any questions from today? Yes. Oh, we've got two questions. One from the one-armed white man. Ajahn. Yeah. Ajahn Brahm, have you seen the new Suda Central website? No. You earn badges. And what? You earn badges. You earn badges? Yeah. And um, I'd give it 10 stars out of 5. You got 10 stars out of 5? I would give it 10 stars out of 5. Oh, 10 stars out of 5. Excellent. Let's go into extremes. Well done. <laughs> Okay, that's Sutta Central, it's, that's Ajahn Sujata. Ajahn Sujata will be given the talk next week so far, if we think, maybe, see if it happens. So I'll be here as well, just, I'll, I'll be in the back heckling. <laughs> so there's a question over here. Yeah, and they would do the ones from the, the little pad. Yes. Um, what have you been most afraid of in your whole life? Well, man, okay. I was still a lay person at the time. I think some of you heard the story before. That uh, still, yeah, still at uh, a, a college at Cambridge, and still just uh, you know messing around in the world. But you know, just I was pretty much committed to being a Buddhist and maybe in the future being a monk. And then it was one of my friends was getting married, so you know we just all went to the the uh, marriage and after the marriage ceremony we were at the reception you know, just all dressed in nice actually dressed in nice suits I actually did wear a suit I think I only worked, worked once or twice anyway <laughs> I was not really into suits but anyway that uh, and they were just you know messing around about 19 or 20 year olds and then somebody asked who's going to be next and then we just pointed to one of my friends so it's still a I know him really well, his name is Jeff, Jeff Perry, his name was. If he's listening to this, I'm sorry, but this happened. <laughs> he's a good mate. And so, when they said, oh, Jeff, he'd probably be next. And then, you know, all the, the guys said, nah, no, no one will marry him. <laughs> you know, it's guys being guys, okay. And just, you know, and then they pointed at me. You know, my lay name was Peter. I said, oh, Peter, he'll probably be next. And I got the same response, ah, no one would marry that man, Peter. But you know what happened next? There was this little girl, you know, she was standing right next to me and she whispered into my ear, I would. <laughs> and I think that's the most scary moment in my life so far. <laughs> I was terrified. <laughs> I moved far away as possible and made sure for the rest of the night and the next week I wasn't close to her. I don't know, it was really unfair, but you know, I was only a 19 year old, 20 year old kid, you know, young man growing up, but that really terrified me. So I think that was the most scared I've ever been. <laughs> Poor girl. I apologised to her, but you know, she really wanted me, but unfortunately, that I married the Buddha. <laughs> or whatever. Anyway, we got an. <laughs> well, I do remember that, this is really scary. There we go. From Poland, South Africa, and from USA. How can I help my sister and her kids with fear? Her husband, their, their, her husband, their father, has a terminal disease and they have little financial support too. Thank you. It's, look, it's amazing just you know, if uh, you, the person writing this, has fear, your children learn fear. And you know, there's so many things happen which are totally unexpected. You know, because my, my, when my father died, I was only 16, my mother, we lived in a council flat, you know, government-supported housing. We didn't really have much money. I think I told last, oh, did I tell it here? I think I told last week that I remember just seeing, like, my father put a one-pound note on the top shelf over the coal fire. And I don't know where the breeze came from. It went into the fire. My father burned himself in his hand trying to get the the pound note out of the fire and my, my mother just burst into tears. Just, just, it was just one pound, it was just such a lot of money for them and they were just struggling so much and they'd lost it in such stupid circumstances. But when my mother, my father passed away, you know, we, we got by, we pulled together, you know, very frugal and, you know, she just, I can't, I shouldn't say this, but she blossomed as a person because she was always, you know, in the shadow of the more powerful um, 
father. You know, he was very kind and loving, but you know, he was just a strong personality. And so, you know, she really just blossomed and became really independent. A little financial support. It's amazing just how many kind people they are. Sometimes, when, you now these are just monks, when monks first went to England, so, you know, they asked, Ajahn Chah, you know, how are we going to get any financial support? And he just came along and said, aren't there any kind people over in Europe? Yeah, if they're kind people, you're a good person, you get support. There are lots of kind people around. So, terminal disease have little financial support too. Just see what happens. But have that positive attitude and just have that sort of uh, no fear. And no fear kills people much more. That story, the other story I was going to tell, Edgar Allan Poe, The Mask of the Red Death. It was only a short story. Edgar Allan Poe was really weird and just, you know, he did these really strange little stories. But this one story, I, I read his stories because it was just a little bit just, um, you know, uh, out of the ordinary. And this one, there was these, these devils, demons, and they were responsible for all these plagues in Europe. And so they had a meeting, like a conference afterwards. And they said, how many, how many people did you kill in, in London? Oh, I killed no, 200. How many people did you kill with the plague in, Fr in Paris? Oh, about 300. How many people in, in Berlin? Oh, about 400. How many people did you, did you, did you kill in Warsaw? Because this lady's from Poland. How many could pick, and he said, I had to kill 50, but fear killed 1,000. I always remember that statement of Edgar Allan Poe, you know, where he said, in that, I don't think it was Poland, but one of the great capitals of Europe, he said, I only killed 50, but fear killed 1,000. And just how deep that quote was. So, even terminal disease, fear, is one of the things which you should always look at and make sure that is not the cause for the death. Fear kills so many people. So, uh, little financial support, sometimes the support comes. It's amazing from just the most unexpected places. So if you keep your mind open to such possibilities, then it happens. Hope creates avenues which you never expect. Fear closes them. And in South Africa, how can I help someone in the last days of not being afraid of death? Okay, this is, depends on their religion, but I remember telling this. To imagine that at the end of this talk, a special occasion, that we were going to give a door prize. And the door prize today was a free trip to say, let's say, um, okay, because many of you are Buddhists, a free trip to India, to Dharamsala, on a first class uh, trip, all expenses paid to see His Holiness the Dalai Lama, have a private, even uh, lunch with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And on your way back, you know, through um, Singapore, is that a good idea, Singapore? Okay, through Singapore, you can have uh, three days in a six-star six hotel with a thousand uh, Sing dollars a day spending money, whatever you want, on your way home. First class all the way. And that was the door prize today. Now, imagine, hypothetically, if you won that. How would you feel? Would you be excited? You know, would you really be looking forward to actually having a private audience you know, with His Holiness the Dalai Lama? Would you? And this wonderful trip. And if you said, well, it's going to be in about you know, four months' time, would you be counting down the days? You know, three months? Only two months to go? One month? Come on, can we get it quicker? And the day before you'd be so excited? Now, what's, what's the difference? What's better? going to see his holdings the Dalai Lama and uh, all expenses paid or going to heaven a great heavenly realm where you don't need money to spend anything you want you just get 
And you not just see the Dalai, you can see even all the great monks, even the Bodhisattvas, and I was going to say the Buddha, but people get upset at me, say so they can't see the Buddha. But anyway, see all these wonderful people up there, not just the 14th Dalai Lama, the 13th, the 12th, the 11th, the whole series of Dalai Lamas. <laughs> Wouldn't that be better? Go to heaven? So? Why is it when people have got a terminal disease? They think, and the doctor says only about three months to live. Can't say, can you make it quicker, please? <laughs> I want to go to heaven. <laughs> you get to two months, only another month to go. I can't wait. Only another month to go, another two weeks to go. Why is it? It's just the different perceptions which people have. If you're a really good, kind person, of course you're going to go to a, a nice rebirth. So, why are people just so afraid of dying? Just because we've been trained that way. We've just been conditioned, brainwashed that way to be afraid of death. Anyone who knows what death is, like, if you want to know what death is, you've come to the right place. Buddhists are the experts on dying. You know why? Because we've died many times, we have the experience. You go to a church, they only die once in those places, so and what do they know? We've got experience. <laughs> That's logical. <laughs> so dying is not so bad. In fact, you know, people who, who have gone past that point of death, they have a wonderful time. They don't want to come back because it's peaceful, wonderful. So as much so that's how you don't be afraid of death. Just go and just check out those people who have near-death experiences. They die and they come back again to tell the tale. Or people who actually can recall their previous lives either through meditation or through the um, uh, regressional therapy. Many of those, and they recount what it's like, you know, just once they've passed that point of death. Really peaceful and happy. Okay, how can we open the door to our hearts how can we open the door to our hearts to fear without getting caught up in the flood of emotions? There are two types of emotions. There is the negative ones like fear and anger and what else like greed and negativity and stuff like that. Those are the negative emotions. But don't try and get rid of all the emotions. The other emotions are beautiful like love, inspiration, kindness, joy, freedom, peace. They're amazing emotions, so encourage those. So if you want to get flooded with the positive emotions like compassion, forgiveness, peace, inspiration, get flooded. Just really get into it. Emotions are not all negative. An enlightened being is very different than a robot. I told this like, Look at the mouth. An enlightened being never has a horizontal mouth. It's turned up at the sides. It's happiness, joy, compassion, kindness. Horizontal is just like you're dead. And down here is if you're really negative. So, you know, these, look at the emotions. The positive ones are cool, go for them. Kindness, joy, happiness, love. Just these beautiful things, and especially in getting into meditation, you really get blissed out. That bliss and ecstasy, not the pill, but the real thing you get in meditation. Now, I mean, that is really just amazing. So that is, get flooded by those. And the other ones, you know, you can let go. So that's, open the door of your hearts, this is what happens. You get flooded. You cry. Beautiful tears. There's many people who have done, I've cried many times, out of joy. Wonderful. Okay, I think you'll be crying in a minute if I don't end now because it <laughs> needs are any busting to go to the toilet or whatever. So let's finish off now and uh, if you have any questions you come up in a few moments. Thank you for everyone who sat it out for an hour and six minutes over time. Arahang Sama Sambuddha Bhagawa Buddhang Bhagawantang Abhiwadeni 
Suakato Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Supatipano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sankhang Namami (laughs) 